Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Kimball Art Museum, and our interviewer, Amy Cardoso, speaks with curator George Shackelford about the exhibition, Monet, The Early Years. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm here at the Kimball Art Museum with Deputy Director George Shackelford to talk about the exhibition, Monet, The Early Years. Thank you so much for joining us. Delighted to be here. So this exhibition showcases works that Claude Monet produced in the first decade of his artistic career. What was the catalyst for this project and how did it come together? The, the inspiration actually comes in a very odd way. Uh, my director Eric Lee and I were having lunch together one day and he said, you know, let's do a show about our late Monet. And I said, yes, that's a good idea. Why don't we do a show about our early Monet, too? <laughs> and so we are doing a pair of exhibitions. Oh, great. Monet, the early years now. And in a few years' time, we'll be back to you with Monet, the late years. And, uh, and it, there are two exhibitions based on the two paintings that the Kimball Museum owns. Mm -hmm. We own the first painting that Monet sent to the Salon exhibition in 1865. And we also own a painting of a weeping willow that he made in 1918 at the very end of his career as a painter, um, in the last decade of his career as a painter, and uh, one of the last paintings that he signed, dated, and sold uh, during his lifetime. Monet was intensely concerned with getting his work in front of the public's eyes. However, at an early age, he had little control at what was admitted into exhibitions. Sure. Um, so what was it like at this time to submit to a show or the salon, like you said, in 1865? Well, very, very early on, in 1857, 56 to 57, mm -hmm. he agree, got people to agree to put his caricatures on view in the public in, in his hometown of Le Havre. Um, and then he submitted a painting in that same town to an exhibition when he was 17. But the big leagues were Paris. Mm -hmm. And the Salon exhibition, which was held every year in Paris, which had literally thousands of paintings on view, was, it was daunting. Um, so imagine him at age 24, he takes a couple of paintings that he has already made, perhaps the previous summer, and in the early months of 1865, he makes two paintings out of them and, and, and submits that pair of paintings to the Salon. One of them is the painting now at the Kimball, which has been with us since the, eight, since the 1960s. Monet got in on his first try which is not necessarily so easy. He, he submits literally this pair of paintings, and not only did they get in, but they got a review. So it was a, it was a big deal for a 24-year-old for a to be noticed so, so favorably in public. Mm -hmm. And it gave him a lot of encouragement, and of course it encouraged his father and his aunt, who were kind of footing his bill at the time, uh, to, to think, well, yes, maybe our young man uh, might be some good after all. So like you said, he was accepted into the salon on his first try. Um, however, the next work that he attempted to create for the salon, perhaps out of that you know, excitement yeah. um, from getting in, um, Luncheon on the Grass didn't quite have the same outcome. He wasn't able to finish it That's right. in time. Um, do you think the scale of the work hindered him or was it purely just no, you know, I, kind of I being think, on the high? I think, I think it's all about the scale. Okay. I think it's all about the scale. He was on a high from the moment he uh, got in the salon, and he actually, you know, what, maybe even while the salon was still on view, he's off on his next uh, gig, mm -hmm. really. And he decides he wants to do something that's fundamentally different from what he'd already done. Right. So he has two beach, you know, skiscapes, a uh, uh, harbor view and a, and a beach scene. And he says, okay, I'm going to go away from the, the sea altogether. I'm going to the woods. And I'm not going to paint pure landscape. I'm going to people it with figures. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to paint a forest scene with lots of people from modern life. And it was a radical departure from what he had done the previous year. But the biggest thing was that he decided to make it a giant of a painting, 13 feet tall by 18 feet wide, which is an enormous canvas for even you know, someone who is going to show the Colosseum with, you know, lions and tigers in it or something. I mean, it was, it was a huge amount of painting for a 25-year-old. Mm -hmm. And to also to paint it so boldly as he started off painting, and as, as it indeed was almost certainly going to be very, very boldly painted. So when you look at the painting today, the patches of bold, big, um, bright color with almost no shading or, or modulation at all, well, that was what it was going to be like. 
He couldn't finish it. Mm -hmm. He literally, I think, figured, I cannot cover all this canvas in time to send it to the salon. So he took an existing painting of a forest, and he made quickly a painting of a figure, that is to say his girlfriend, his lover, Camille Doncieux, mm -hmm. and he did a sort of society portrait of her, sent the forest painting and the figure painting to the salon, and accomplished his goals, but in two pictures instead of one giant one. And so now we see this Lunch on the Grass actually in two pieces. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about wh why it looks like that and how? It's, it's an amazing story. Imagine that you're 25 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, not so hard for you to imagine. <laughs> I actually am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and imagine that you owned a 13 by 18 foot rug, and it was too big to put in any apartment that you lived in, or what, how were you going to deal with something that was really quite so big as that? Right. And so Monet had this painting, not finished, that's 13 feet tall by 18 feet wide. And you can't keep that stretched. It's like, you know, you can't, you can't even get out of the door of mm -hmm. the studio with it stretched like that. So he's obliged to roll it up. And starting at the left side, he rolls it up so that the, what was on the, on the right side of the canvas it ends up on the outside of the roll. And having given it over at a certain point to a guy who he owed money to, Monet often owed a lot of money, uh, he retrieved it much later, only to find that it had been very badly damaged by the way the guy had stored it. So that the whole right side of the painting was molded mm -hmm. and he couldn't save it. He was able to save an intact strip at the far left. That's the big tall panel that we see behind us. Right. And then out of the middle, he, by cutting off the top and the bottom a few feet, he was able to create another painting, more or less a square, mm -hmm. that centered on Camille, his lover, his mistress, um, serving uh, the lunch to a, an assembled crowd of guests. So that painting becomes a separate image for him mm -hmm. from the 1880s onwards. And it becomes one of the important images that he uses to tell people about what he was when he was young. Mm. So that when he's very old, he's constantly showing people this painting and saying, look, here's what I did when I was in my 20s. We do know that the painter, Eugene Baudon, yes. um, began teaching him as a teenager. Yes. Um, what kind of influence did he have on Monet? Eugène Boudin was a, was, a, uh, was a painter who lived in Le Havre, and uh, Le Havre is the town at the end of the Seine where Monet basically grew up. Mm -hmm. And um, he had seen some of the young man's paintings and thought, well, or s sketches really rather, and said, I need to teach this guy a few things. And I think what, what he really taught him was to respect nature and to always look to nature as your ultimate source of inspiration. And that he did by encouraging Monet to get out from behind his desk where he would make these beautiful caricatures mm -hmm. of people and to actually take his pad and his pencils or later his canvas and his brushes out of doors and to actual, actually paint in nature and to paint in front of the actual motif. And that started something in Monet that he would never leave up. I mean, mm -hmm. he would never give up the notion that that nature should be his first source of inspiration. So at the very end of his life, he's still you know, taking the canvas outside and making pictures in front of his actual garden motifs. Mm -hmm. In addition to Vaudon, um, he went on to work with a group known as the Impressionists. Um, was he working alongside them early in his life or was it primarily at the end? No, um, the, the artists who became known as the right. Impressionists um, they re that name wasn't applied to them until after 1874, right. when Monet sent a painting um, called Impression Sunrise mm -hmm. to an independent show, and the, it was ridiculed as being an impression, and that was the origin of, the, of the, what started as an insult turned into a, a, a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. And, but many of the artists who showed in that first show of the Impressionists, as they were later called, right. were in fact people that Monet knew in the 1860s. Okay. And chief among them, you could say, were um, Pizarro, Sisley, and Renoir, mm -hmm. all artists that Monet met when he was in his 20s living in Paris. And they evolved together and kept up with each other and, uh, and eventually banded together and showed together. And, uh, and so it was, a, it was always a kind of a, a, a happy meeting of a bunch of people who had some of the same ideas, who fed on each other's ideas, and who 
made something even greater out of it than they would have done on their own. You know, in this exhibition, we see him developing as an artist that brings up two significant points. Um, his development as an artist, a person wanting to change the system, kind of like the other Impressionist sure. artist, um, for example, submitting works seen as unfinished to the salon. Yes. Um, and also the development of his own personal style, the unfinished yeah. nature of them. Um, what are your thoughts on the evolution of his style? Well, the main thing is that it, it, the evolution of Monet as an artist is not linear in any way than you would, that you would necessarily expect. So that even in the same year, he can move back and forth between a relatively careful, tight is the wrong word, but controlled, highly controlled way of painting. And then he can, almost at the same time or within you know, weeks or days or months, um, come up with something that's much more broad, that's much more suggestive of, of a kind of, I don't know, improvisational way of, of looking at things. So I think that uh, we mustn't assume that an artist begins at one point and steadily there's this sort of march towards another point because mm -hmm. the, it's often twisting and turning and sometimes goes back on itself in order to move forward mm -hmm. again. And, uh, and so I think that that's, that's one of the things that you find in this exhibition. If you're caring particularly about dates, um, you might be confounded that something that was painted in the same year, they look so different and, mm -hmm. they, and they don't necessarily um, seem to, to flow one from another. But that's part of being a youngster. Um, yeah, there are quite a few in this exhibition that I'm like, wow, that's... Yeah. How is that the same year? Exactly, yeah. and and so I think you're I think you find someone who really is open to experimentation, mm -hmm. who's not afraid to fail, and who is um, and happily. If I've included a painting in this show, it's because I don't think it's a failure. <laughs> but but there are paintings that 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 might have just not worked mm -hmm. that ended up working very well indeed. Um, there were there's some risk taking paintings in this show, others that are more um, that are calmer and more more crafted and probably made with a, a, a greater idea towards them appealing to someone else and therefore being something that he could sell and, and eat off of, you know, live, live, with, live within his meager means mm -hmm. as a result of selling one or two paintings. Do you think that by being this risk taker, um, did that kind of brand him as a leader of this new aesthetic in a way? He certainly was, from the very beginning, he was seen by the other artists in this group as a kind of leader, and uh, and in again, again and again in this exhibition, you see why because the the talent is just it just shines through. Um, but he was amongst them. He was known as maybe the most audacious of them. Also, he was the maybe best spoken of them all, and um, and certainly the best dresser. He almost always had linen shirts that had little ruffles on the cuffs mm -hmm. instead of dressing down like a like a sort of um, trampy artist uh, mm. that was some of the styles of the others, yeah. In this catalog, you have a quote that I really love. Mm -hmm. And it says that this exhibition hopes to communicate the nature of Monet's invention in every sense, to explore Monet's creativity, but also his relation of an artistic personality. Um, what is the importance of having this exhibition here at the Kimball, and what do you hope that the public gains from it? The encounter one-on-one -on -one with the things that are here will change your notion of what Monet was. Um, again and again, people say, I can't believe Monet painted that. Mm -hmm. And that's what you'll find in this exhibition, things that you never knew that he did, in spite of his being probably the most famous artist, maybe even, even with Van Gogh, the most famous artist of all time. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Glad to be here. <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Shackelford for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to KimballArt.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar.